Okay, good morning. Before we look at the experiment to verify Joule's law, there's three things we need to bear in mind and keep in mind at all times. The first is, what is power? Power is defined as the rate at which energy is converted from one type into another. In a formula, power is energy converted divided by time. Energy in joules, time in seconds, power obviously in joules per second or watts. Two things to bear in mind. One, that formula actually isn't in the maths tables. They give this version of it, power equals work done divided by time. That implies, of course, that the work done on a system is equal to the energy that it gains or loses. And the second thing I want you to bear in mind is if power equals energy over time, then the total amount of energy will have to equal power multiplied by time. That's something we're going to be using in Joule's Law experiment later. That's the definition of power. The second thing is, what is Joule's Law? Well, obviously, as we said yesterday, Joule's Law is the power of a conductor, power of a resistor, the number of joules per second it produces, is directly proportional to the current squared. Power, which is measured in joules per second, or watts, Current, measured in amps, and power is directly proportional to current squared. The constant of proportionality there is the resistance. So you could also write power equals resistance multiplied by current squared. If you were asked what is Joule's law or to state Joule's law, that formula well labeled is sufficient for full marks. And the third thing that I want you to bear in mind is the energy needed to change the temperature of something. Well, If you want to change something's temperature, you obviously have to add a certain quantity of energy to it. And the amount of energy you give to it will equal the mass multiplied by the specific heat capacity multiplied by the change in temperature. That's the energy needed to change temperature. That will also come in later into the Joule's Law question. Now, looking at the Joule's Law experiment. Well, here is the traditional diagram of the circuit of the apparatus set up to verify Joule's Law. <coughs> now, the star of the show really is this guy here. This is the heating coil. And what the heating coil will do is convert electrical energy from the battery into heat energy. And a lot of people forget to put in water so we just put the water in there and label it as such. The water is in a copper calorimeter. And outside the copper calorimeter, to prevent any heat loss to the surroundings, we have some lagging. Or insulation, if you wish to call it that. Now, the coil of wire, the heating coil, converts electrical energy into heat energy. And in this part of the circuit, we have a nanometer. The ammeter, of course, will measure the electric current. We have a power supply. The power supply supplies the electrical energy. A lot of people forget this, uh, and this is quite useful in the circuit. A switch. And in order to change the current, we have a, a variable resistor. So that is the circuit diagram for the experiment to verify Joule's law. <coughs> There's one thing missing from that circuit. If you have a quick look, can you tell me what is actually missing from that, that whole diagram? Well, let's just look at it this way. In Joule's law, we say there's two variables. One is the power, and the other is the current. And here's our problem. There's no real way in this circuit to actually directly measure the power. Quite easy to measure the current that's flowing using the ammeter, but there's no way of measuring power. And just always keep in mind, what we're trying to prove 
is power is directly proportional to current squared. And that will effectively mean we're going to have to plot a graph with power on one axis and current squared on the other axis. And if that graph is a straight line through the origin, we can conclude from that that power is directly proportional to current squared. Obviously, even in a sketch graph, I'd like to put down the correct units. So power in joules per second or watts and current squared in an in unusual unit called amps squared. And clearly, there's no way in this diagram we can measure power. But in the leading cert syllabus, it says, don't actually measure power, measure the rise in temperature that the current causes in the resistor. So if we're going to measure rise in temperature, we need another instrument in there. And that other instrument, of course, is a thermometer. So we'll put in a thermometer. So what effect we're going to what in effect we're going to prove is not that power is proportional to current squared, but instead of power, we're going to prove that rise in temperature of the water is proportional to current squared. And that gives another little problem because the rise in temperature depends on different things. The rise in temperature depends on the current, but it also depends on the mass of the water used, and it also depends on how long you leave the current flow. So this is where our controls come in. This is where we say that two things must be kept constant in this experiment. The mass of the water and the time the current flows for. These must at all times be kept constant. Because we want to see what effect the current has on the rise in temperature. So these guys, mass of water and the time the current flows, must be kept constant. So, when the Joule's Laws experiment is done, you put in a certain mass of water, let's say 0 0.2 kilograms. You allow that to flow for a certain length of time, let's say 3 minutes, 3 sixes, let's say five minutes, five sixes, 300 seconds, and you find the rise in temperature for the first current. Then you increase the current, let's say up from one amp to two amps, again find the rise in temperature for a fixed mass of water for a fixed amount of time and see what that rise in temperature is. And at the end of the experiment, the results will look like this. You'll have a whole row of currents, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 amps, and the corresponding rises in temperature, like that. And current would have to be squared, so you'd have to square the current. And then you would plot a graph of current squared against rise in temperature. The rise in temperature, of course, we're taking as a representation of the, the power of the heating coil. So the normal graph that's given is rise in temperature here and current squared like that. Now, the rise in temperature, of course, is measured in degrees Celsius. And the current squared is measured in units called amps squared. The points you get should approximate a straight line. So when you join them together, you should get a straight line through the origin. Now it's very important to state what that means. As the graph is a straight line, through the origin, this proves that rise in temperature is proportional to current squared. And remember, we're taking the rise in temperature as an indication of the power of the heating coil, the number of joules per second it produces. Okay, normally in the leaving cert they give you rises in temperature and the current, you've got to square the current, 
and then plot this graph. Obviously, they would ask you, um, a very obvious question to ask would be, well, how do you know the relationship between these two things? And as the graph is a straight line, this proves rise in temperature is proportional to current squared, which if rise in temperature is taken as an indication of power, this proves Joule's law. There is a very traditional calculation that is often given in leaving cert questions at the end of this uh, type of question. If you go back to the diagram for a second, what essentially is being done here is electrical energy is being converted into heat energy. So if we take that as our starting point, just take that as our starting point, electrical energy is being converted into heat energy. Now, can we put a formula on this? Well, we said at the very, very start, we said at the very start, if we wind back, that the energy needed to change the temperature of something is a product of the mass by the specific heat capacity by the change of temperature. So, the heat energy gained by the water will be the mass of the water by the specific capacity of the water by the change of temperature of the water. The electrical energy supplied will be defined as the uh, power oh sorry the electrical energy supplied well if you just think of it this way power equals resistance by current squared and power equals energy divided by time so that means the total energy will have to be power multiplied by time juggling that formula around you get energy is power multiplied by time so if we write down r i squared as the power and multiply it by the time in seconds that is the total electrical energy supplied to the water and the total electrical energy supplied to the water will equal the heat energy gained by the water now generally in this kind of question they ask you to calculate the resistance of the heating coil so if we just juggle this around and say resistance of heating coil equals mass of water by specific capacity of water by change of temperature of water I'm leaving resistance on the left where it started all these things on the right bringing I squared and T over I squared and T over like that now generally in this question you're given the mass of the water you're given the specific capacity of the water and you're given the time that the current flows for obviously that would be in kilograms that would be in the appropriate units, joules per kilogram per degree, and that would be in seconds. But you're, this guy here, how do you work this out? Well, if you go back to your graph, if you go back to the graph and look at the graph here, what is the slope of this graph? Well, the slope of any graph will be what's on the y-axis divided by what's on the x-axis. The slope of any graph would be an average y over an average x. So in this graph here, what's on the y-axis? What's on the y-axis? Change of temperature. What's on the x-axis? Current squared. So the slope of this graph will be rise in temperature over current squared. Obviously, any time you plot a graph and they ask you any calculations and it's a straight line graph, the first thing you'll do is get the slope using the, the, the normal way of getting slope. So, if you get the slope of this graph, it's an average rise in temperature over current squared. So, if you come down here and look here, that there is rise in temperature over current squared. So, that is equal to the slope of the graph. So, you can write this formula again. Resistance of the heating coil is the mass of the water multiplied by the specific capacity of the water divided by the time the current flows in seconds multiplied by the slope of the graph and that is the calculation you will need at the end of most of these leaving cert questions that ask about about this when it comes to Joule's law
finally, at the end of these kind of questions, they always ask, well, can you give a few precautions to make this experiment a little bit more accurate? And there's a couple of precautions that are very, very common ones. Well, first of all, lag the calorie to prevent any heat loss to the surroundings. You could also, of course, put a lid on the calorimeter to prevent heat loss to the surroundings. Second precaution, use a more sensitive thermometer. I'll always explain what that means. That means it measures to more places of decimal. For example, a digital thermometer is a very good sensitive thermometer. Third precaution, use a thermometer of low heat capacity. And generally state why you do this. Why would you use a thermometer of low heat capacity so it won't take much heat from the liquid it's measuring? Um, very important one here, very important one here. Keep the mass of the water and the time the current flows the same each time you run this experiment. Why? We want two variables in this experiment. Current and rise in temperature are the two variables. Current and rise in temperature, of course, is an indication of power. We don't want to introduce a third variable. And by changing the mass of the water or changing the time the current flows, that would introduce a third variable. Um, each time you run the experiment, though, you don't want the current to change in that particular run. So you can adjust the size of the current using the variable re resistor. There are uh, five very, very common precautions that are associated with this experiment. Finally, I want you to do a bit of work yourself. In the um, handout that's up on Office 365 for the experiments, it's up there. I don't think it's even in a folder. There's this question, after Jules' Law, there's this question. And this question is one I would like you to attempt and try to get answers back to me by some mechanism. And I think that's just simply photographing it and working out how to, um, to, to do this in Office 365. In an experiment to verify Jules' Law, student passed a heating coil. Uh, that, ex that question, I want you to go through that question. I want you to answer the questions underneath on a sheet of paper. Somehow take a photograph of that and get it back to me. Today is Tuesday, shall we say, by 11 o'clock on Thursday, and see how that goes. There's one, two, three, four, five, six little parts there, and I want you to try that. Now, there are, I think, answers given on the next page, but I want you to attempt the question yourself by looking back in the video, by looking back in the notes, before you actually look at the suggested answers. And I'm hoping that results will come to me through Office 365 by some mechanism by 11 o'clock on Thursday. Thank you very much.